15 minute lecture series on anatomy. Chapter 6 Bone Tissue. Functions of skeleton include structural support, so we can stand up, protection from soft, delicate organs getting damaged, assistance in movement with the help of muscles, mineral storage and release, especially calcium and phosphate, blood cell production, that is all of the blood cells in the red bone marrow, and triglyceride storage in the yellow bone marrow. There are cartilage that's also important for the skeletal system, especially at the joints. Uh, so, for instance, the end of all of our bones that form moving joints, there is articular cartilage covering the ends of those bones. There is costal cartilage that also connects the ribs to the sternum. These are both made out of hyaline cartilage. And then out of fibrocartilage, we have the discs of cartilage that attach some bones, such as the intervertebral discs of the vertebral column, the pubic symphysis, and some of the pads within the uh, knee and other joints. Long bones are longer than they are wide, and they possess what is called a diaphysis or a shaft. Short bones are somewhat cubic, have about the same width as they are uh, tall. Uh, flat bones are very thin, basically two plates of compact bone tissue surrounding some spongy bone tissue. And irregular bones, they tend to have complex shapes and have trouble falling in the other categories. You also have sesamoid bones. These are bones that develop within tendons that are under a lot of stress. The only sesamoid bones that we possess that most humans have are the two patella bones. All the other sesamoid bones someone might possess are just random occurrences and have no names of their own. Finally, there are sutural bones. These are small bones found within the uh, joining of cranial bones. So here is a junction, a uh, between two cranial bones, and there's a little smaller bone found in the suture. There's a sutural bone, can vary in numbers from one person to another, and they do not have their own names. We look at the anatomy of a long bone, we see that it has a diaphysis, a long cylindrical shaft made primarily of compact bone tissue. Within the shaft is the medullary cavity, a space that is, of course, filled with yellow bone marrow. Uh, then we have the ends of the bones, the proximal epiphysis and the distal epiphysis. And these epiphyses are on the outside compact bone, on the inside spongy bone. And in between the spongy bones, little uh, trabeculae is red bone marrow. Uh, between the epiphyses and the diaphysis is the metaphysis. Metaphysis is at both ends, so you have a proximal and distal one. Um, in Kids, it possesses the epithelial plate, which is made of hyaline cartilage and allows the long bones to grow longer. In adults, it has become the epithelial line, which has come, uh, been replaced with ossified bone tissue. Again, at the very ends of bones where they come together to form joints that are movable, you find articular cartilage, which is hyaline cartilage. This helps to reduce the friction at these moving joints and also to absorb some shock. Surrounding the outside of the bone is the periosteum. It is composed of two la layers, an outer fibrous layer composed of dense irregular connective tissue and an inner osteogenic layer made of various cells of the bone. Also on the inside, lining the medullary cavity and the girders or trabeculae of the spongy bone is the endosteum, similar to periosteum except it's only the osteogenic cells. All right, if we look at bones, we find they have various structural features. Uh, for instance, some have fissures. Fissures are long, narrow slits between adjacent bones or within a bone that allows for the passage of structures such as nose, blood vessels, and so on. Uh, some bones have a foramen. A foramen is a hole, foramen for more than one. It's just an opening to allow the passage of structures. Uh, fossa, some bones have fossas. These are shallow depressions, little maybe bowl-like depressions. Uh, found in the bone. Uh, sulcus is a long furrow running into the bone structure. The furrow allows space for things like blood vessels, nerves, tendons, and so forth that then run along the surface of the bone. Uh, a meatus is a tube-like opening that often ends in a uh, wall, so it is not continuous, doesn't go all the way through. An example of this would be the external auditory meatus or ear canal. Uh, some processes uh, form joints. When they form joints, they are smooth so that the movement at the joints re has a reduced amount of friction occurring. 
An example is rounded knobs. Rounded knobs are nice and smooth, they're often called condyle. Facets are flat and smooth, maybe slightly curved. So a flat facet can also be at a moving joint. A head is a very large, smooth, rounded projection. Often following the head is a structure called the neck, which isn't smooth. And then rough areas that project out are often attachment points for tendons and ligaments. For instance, you can have crest. Crest is a long, roughened ridge that is an attachment for some muscles. Uh, epicondyle is a rough projection that is uh, proximal to condyles or above the condyles. You'll find the epicondyle. Uh, line is a rough and narrow ridge or border. They can be quite small in some cases. Uh, spinous process is a portion of bone that sticks out dramatically, usually. It's a roughened and sharp. Uh, trochanter is a large roughened area that attaches muscles that is found on the femur. A tubercle is a, a large roughened structure that sticks out, but for attachment of the muscles found in the humerus. And a tuberosity is a large roughened area. Down here, for instance, that can be uh, found on many bones, actually. Uh, there's some other uh, structures out there with names that you will eventually learn. All right, histology. There are four kinds of bone cells. There are the osteoprogenitor cells. These are stem cells that, when necessary, will divide and develop into osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are very important cells. They lay down the extracellular matrix, the organic material, that then becomes calcified proper bone tissue. And then should an osteoblast get entrapped within a bone tissue, it becomes an osteocyte. And the osteocyte's job is then to maintain the bone tissue's health and relay any signals concerning bone stress. So osteoprogenitor cell becomes osteoblasts, osteoblasts become osteocytes. Another cell that's important is the osteoclasts. The osteoclasts function in resorption. They break down the organic material by breaking down the organic material, it releases the minerals that are stored. Uh, the bones matrix, the primarily uh, organic components, you have about 30% organic components, ground substance, and lots and lots of collagen fibers. This gives the bone flexibility and tensile strength. Then about 55% is the inorganic components, the minerals being stored, primarily calcium and phosphate in the form of hydroxyapatite. This gives the bone its hardness. And then in a living bone, about 15% of it is water. Now, bone tissue is constantly getting broken down and built back up. Uh, so bone deposition is when the osteoplasts, osteoblasts build up the organic material, and that becomes calcified, removing calcium and phosphate from the bloodstream, bone deposition. Bone resorption is when the osteoclasts cut up or cleave the organic components, when this happens, it returns the calcium and phosphate to the bloodstream. And these two processes are constantly going on in our body and are refer referred to collectively as bone remodeling. Here is some compact bone tissue. Within compact bone tissue, you see this reoccurring structure called an osteon, where you have a central canal, a space that's filled with nerves and blood vessels, surrounded by rings of material. These rings of material are called the concentric lamellae, concentric concentric circles. You also see these dark spots. These dark spots are lacuna, or little spaces, and in the lacuna is the osteocyte. And then to connect the osteocytes to the central canal's blood vessels, you have the caniculi, one caniculus, many caniculi, little bitty tubes that connect the central canal to the lacuna and filled with projections from the osteocyte. Here is what it would look like on our model, the concentric lamellae, the osteon, and so on. Um, other areas where you have lamellae that are not osteons include around the very inside and very outside of the bone structure. These are called circumferential lamellae going around the circumference, so either outer circumferential lamellae or inner circumferential lamellae. Also, there's often little patches of bone tissue called interstitial lamellae. These are found between the osteons, and they are remnants of old osteons, again, from the whole remodeling process. You also see that uh, the outside of the bone is covered with the periosteum, the outer fibrous layer, the inner osteogenic layer. There are perforating canals going along the width of the bone, while the central canals are going along the length. They all have blood vessels and nerves in them. 
There's also perforating fibers that connect the periosteum to the bone. And then on the inside, lining the inside would be the endosteum. In spongy bone, there are no osteums. You still have lamella, you still have canicula, you still have lacuna where the osteocytes are, but instead they form these girders or ridges that are called trabiculi, forming the spongy-like matrix. Um, there are many blood vessels that need to come in and out of bones because bones are living organisms. Uh, they are organs in their own right. There's the nutrient form in an extra large hole for the extra large nutrient artery and veins to pass through. And then there are various other arteries and veins going into the various regions of the bone. Bone formation can occur through one of two processes, intramembranous ossification or endochondrial ossification. Uh, the flat bones come from in the skull come from intramembranous ossification, where you start off with a large sheet, a membrane of mesenchyme connective tissue, and then little ossification centers develop within that big sheet of connective tissue. This is where it starts to calcify, and osteoblasts will start producing the organic bony matrix that collects that calcium and phosphate mineral. This will continue to spread out, giving you little patches of bony tissue. Um, as it's spreading out, some of the osteoblasts will become osteocytes within the lacuna, this will continue to spread out until eventually all the various um, ossification centers attach to each other, giving you a big sheet of what looks like spongy bone tissue. And eventually, that through continued development of the bone tissue, you end up with the structures you expect. Two big sheets of compact bone tissue above and below the central spongy bone tissue, and of course on the very outside, the periosteum. Endochondrial ossification, on the other end, is cartilage, where a cartilage model of the bones get replaced by uh, bone tissue. This is a six-step process that occurs um, when we are embryo and fetus. So it starts off with a hydling cartilage model of most of the bones of the body from the neck down, approximately where they are, approximate shape. Over time, an ossification center will start to develop in the middle of the bone. Uh, osteoblasts develop and putting down the organic material and that starts to become calcified. This will continue to spread, giving you the primary ossification center that starts to form these structures you would expect in the diathesis, including the incorporation of blood vessels. Um, and finally, uh, in the diathesis, you will now have the compact bone on the outside, the medullary cavity, and so on. However, to get the epiphyses properly Structured. You do have to have secondary ossification centers in the proximal and distal epiphyses that begin to produce the bony material for those ends of the bones, which finally leads to the structures we expect, the articular cartilage at the ends of the bones, the uh, hyaline cartilage forming the epiphyseal plate in the infant and child that will continue to allow the bone to grow in length. And of course, eventually, the epiphyseal plate will become an epiphyseal line in the adult because there'll be no more growth in length for these long bones. In width, what happens is that the osteoblasts and the periosteum will deposit bone matrix that become calcified and start to form tubes that surround blood vessels and nerves that eventually lead to the production of new osteons. So it occurs at the periosteum, at the outside of the bone, the periphery. Bone width will then continue to get wider and wider, while at the same time causing the inside to thin out so that the bone overall has approximately the same thickness because we don't want our bones to get super heavy. Uh, and bone remodeling, of course, occurs throughout our entire life. Uh, damage to bones. You can get an open fracture where the bone sticks out of the skin. You can have a communicate fracture where the bone is shattered. You can have a green stick where it's only partially broken. You can have impacted where one jams into another end. You can have a POTS fracture where the fibula gets broken and some tendons torn near the tibia. You can have a Coles fracture where the radius gets broken and it overlaps. Um, a depressed fracture where there's a uh, broken, shattered inside, but it doesn't spread out. A spiraled fracture going up along the length of the bone. At a fracture, you get a blood hematoma that first develops. This gets replaced with fibrous cartilage uh, callus, which then gets replaced with a bony callus of spoon, spongy bone tissue, which eventually gets replaced with new compact bone tissue. Full remodeling, you got a new bone again, and it's awesome. Most loss of bone occurs as you get older. Loss of bone mass, a lot of the organic material, the minerals becomes brittle, easier to break, becomes called osteoporosis, more common in women, but can occur in anybody. Next.